Uh, good morning again. Uh, I am Slavica Jakovic. I'm a faculty member of Honors College at Valparaiso University. I'm a scholar of religion and nationalism, and I'm delighted to be with all of you today to moderate this round table. Uh, we have four, four speakers this morning. Um, Jay joined us from very different parts of the world uh, to consider the range of questions, problems, and phenomena shaping and giving impetus to the church youth leadership today. And they will speak for about 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Uh, each presentation will be take about 20 minutes. I will introduce them just before their presentations. And then after the presentations are completed, we'll, take, we'll open the floor for some questions. Uh, our first speakers are Dr. Jeremy Molino and Dr. Rito uh, Berry. Uh, they're joining us from Philippines. Dr. Molino is religious education professor in St. Louis University at Baguio City. She holds the doctorate in educational management uh, from the university and is currently finishing her PhD in applied theology at De La Salle University in Manila. Her areas of research interest include empirical theology, religious education, youth spirituality, and eco-theology. Dr. Rita Baring is full professor and former chair of the Department of Theology and Religious Education at De La Salle University in Manila. His research interests include empirical theology, religious education, Christian spirituality, survey research, and youth studies. He held several professorial and academic chairs between 2007 and 2019. And among the many academic roles he played, he was a research fellow of the United Board at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. He was also engaged in various projects focusing on environment and sustainability, religion, religious studies, politics, cultural studies, philosophy, and education. Dr. Berry and Dr. Molino will address the Catholic youth leadership in the church through the religious identity from, from a Filipino sample. Dr. Berry and Dr. Molino, the floor is yours. Hello and good morning, dear colleagues from DePaul University. I hope you can hear me well. Okay. Yes. And also hello to our colleagues from Asia. Good evening from the Philippines. So we are thankful to DePaul University for this uh, opportunity to share the results of our research. Uh, first of all, thanks to uh, Dr. William Ticabano, the, the, the director of the uh, CWCIT for his kind invitation. And also our heartfelt thanks to Karen Kraft and Marlon Aguilar for their gracious assistance and kind communication. We are hopeful that our presentation will contribute to the growing leadership of our young Catholics. We are here to present under youth leadership in the church. The uh, title of our study is... Uh, uh, reviewing Catholic youth leadership in the church through religious identity from a, from a Filipino sample. I am uh, Jeremy Molina from St. Louis University, Baguio City, Philippines, and my co-researcher is Rito Baring from De La Salle University, Manila, Philippines. So the uh, presentation will take place in this uh, sequence. Okay, uh, I will present the first part and the results until the conclusion will be presented by Rito. Okay, um, youth leadership discourse spells uh, out their ability to uh, govern themselves, their community uh, communities and uh, manage change. Yeah. MacNeil in 2006 observes how literature traditionally assigns the uh, sense of youth leadership to skills, capacities and knowledge as contrasted to adult leadership. Uh, discourse typically anchored on power and control. A cursory look of uh, research on youth leadership development suggests that attention is largely given towards development and nurturance of skills and capacities while studying. Scholarship generally identifies internal and external aspects in uh, youth leadership development. Um, the internal dimension includes the capacity for self-determination, we speak of the strengths and weaknesses through form attitudes. Self-determination includes a wide range of self-support mechanisms needed to build an interior scaffolding, which includes a sense of self, vision, independence, and self-appreciation. 
The external uh, dimension includes management of uh, social change, the ability to guide and influence others, and capacity to adapt new challenges. The uh, internal uh, and external dimensions correspond to factors fundamental to a vocation for leadership in the church. Um, echoing uh, this uh, correspondence, King and Farrell in 2008 speak of religion as a resource for positive youth development. The internal and external aspects of leadership development is incidentally linked to religious development as suggested in practice and scholarship. Dola Height and Marx in 2019 see youth and religious development foundation to specific social engagements. Student leadership can be characterized as Christian leadership among the models articulated by, uh, by Hine in 2014. From uh, research, we take note how youth pro-social engagements and uh, peacemaking, among others, are influenced by religious motives and attitudes. From these studies, an overall sense of religious identity support youth engagements propelled by youth volunteerism within and outside the church. In scholarship, religious identity formation is uh, typically based on religious affiliation and religious attitudes. From these uh, resources, uh, we, want to, uh, we want to know from a sample how the Filipino youth religious identity characterized through their sense of religious affiliation and religious attitudes are associated with the youth pro-social engagements as a function of leadership in church life. And to address these uh, insights from local empirical studies of Filipino religious uh, attitudes and local Filipino communities, we will use Richard's uh, Osmer's uh, framework to discuss the results. We frame uh, religious attitudes and religious identity as a preliminary basis to articulate the task and the promise of youth leadership in the Philippine church while attendance in religious services has gone down to 48%, but views uh, towards religion remain favorable at 85%. Similarly, um, church-coordinated surveys also identified high religiosity scores among Filipinos. We take uh, cognizance of the uh, unique uh, configurations of resilient Filipino youth religious attitudes indicated by recent empirical studies. It is uh, this unique Filipino religious mindset that uh, supports our desire to understand Catholic youth leadership. When uh, it comes to the studies on youth or religiosity, um, the recent uh, empirical studies on uh, Filipino youth uh, report uh, a significant, uh, significantly higher percentage of youth indicating religious affiliation and uh, very low religious disaffiliation at 1.6%. Overall, uh, Filipino youth religious attitudes remain favorable towards institutional affiliation and engagements. Youth uh, attitude towards religion reflect views about institutional affiliation, spiritual life, and religious engagements. While Western literature mostly uh, differentiates between religiosity and spirituality, Filipino youth um, views uh, towards religion uh, reflect a fused view of spirituality or religiosity as a single notion. Um, religion has emerged as a prominent source for youth identity formation. Davis and Key Young in 2016 characterized uh, religious identity in terms of religious self-identification and religiosity. The individual sense of uh, religious affiliation is a fundamental aspect of religious identity. In the latest youth um, construct on religion, uh, religious affiliation is more than institutional affiliation as it now articulates belief in God and ident identification with God. Together with affiliation, religious uh, sentiments or effect is the other component associated with one's religious identification. A third component of religious identity is religious behavior conforming to religious expectations, which includes one's affinity to religious rituals and church attendance. Viewing religious identity in terms of religious identification, religious sentiments, and religious behavior emphasize that student religious ideas are value-laden, not value-neutral. 
religious belief in this equation is an invitation to take action instead of uh, uh, being privately confined. In, a, in another U.S. study, uh, in the study of Wilson and Hanoski in 1995, membership in the church, church involvement, and volunteering for pro-social activities are linked. And a recent study uh, identified religious behavior and student spirituality as predictors of uh, pro-social outcomes and global citizenship antecedents. So we view youth spiritual and religious behavior as an influencing agent for moral and pro-social value formation. We analyze students' religious attitudes to characterize their religious identity formation and analyze the prospects of Catholic youth engagements in the church. Thus, religious identity is proposed as an influencing agent for religious motivation and attitudes. And utilize, u, utilizing the internal and external correspondence in youth leadership development, we acknowledge how the individual's identity, the interior formation may translate to externalized capacities, directing one's ability towards social transformation, create impacts, and adjust to changing contexts. Hence, Discerning leadership for and in the church essentially boils down to religious identity characterizations through religious attitudes. Now let me share with you the results of our study. The present study is a cross-sectional survey from three locations in the Philippines. And the instrument used in the measure on is the measure on students' attitudes towards religion with demographics. Statistical analysis include uh, descriptive analysis, correlation, and t-test to describe the relationship between religious identity and pro-social attitudes. Interpretation and discussion will be made using Richard Osmer's framework on theological analysis. Our sample is derived from a larger study of youth Christian environmentalism by Baring, Molino, and Reisen in 2021. However, we limited our sample to Catholic students only from three locations in Central and Northern Philippines. University ethical clearance has been granted for this purpose. We analyzed the correspondence between religious affiliation indicated by church visit and Catholic identification, religious attitudes, and student religiosity using the measure on religion. The participants comprise 787 college students in three locations. Uh, participants aged 18 to 19 years old constitute 70% while 30% are 20 to 25 years old. Female participants at 60% dominate their male counterparts. There are more humanities and education students than technical core students from the sample. After demographics, the analysis will present the following student religious identities indicated by their claims of Catholic affiliation, church visit frequencies, and its correspondence to religious attitudes. Age and gender is also tested for its association to religious attitudes. Now, their student religious identity. Student religious identity is analyzed in terms of religious affiliation, religious attitudes, larger data set, only 2%, only 2% declared they have no religion. And in the present study, 77% say they visit the church one to three times a week, while 3% claim they visit the church four to seven times a week. Only 20% of our Catholic informants admit that they don't visit the church at all. While their religious views remain very favorable, and this is a consistent result, overall Catholic students' religious identification for belief is relatively lower compared to their spiritual uh, dimension, which is more of the effect or the spirituality items, and, the, and then behavior. Hence, Catholic student religious attitudes from our sample tilt more towards spirituality and religiosity than cognitive religious identification through belief. Now, now 
student visit to the church is significantly positively correlated with religious attitudes religious identification uh, under belief and together with spirituality and religiosity so there is a significant positive correlation with religious attitudes there is a very significant positive correlation as well between church visit and Effective dimension contains spiritual attitudes. It means the higher frequency of church visits, the more they exhibit these spiritual traits among the three religious dimensions, which includes a sense of the nearness of God, security of God, uh, the sense of security in God's company, and giving time for God. Unlike religious attitudes, church visit is not significantly associated with age levels. To compare the mean scores for religious attitudes in terms of gender and age, we perform some uh, independent sample speed tests. There is a significant difference in three dimensions of religious attitudes for gender. The male informants significantly differ statistically in their views towards religious perspectives in terms of belief, spirituality, and religiosity. The female participants show higher agreements in the three dimensions of religious attitudes over their male counterparts. When testing for age group and religious attitudes, no significant statistical differences are noted in three dimensions of their religious attitudes. The present study affirms previous findings showing significant positive correlations between church visit and religious attitudes as affirmed in previous studies by Reimers and Graham in 2006. Our sample showed how claims of institutional affiliation and higher church visit frequencies translate to affirmative religious identification through effective religious attitudes suggested by Davis and Kian in 2016. Overall, this positive relationship between church visits and their religious attitudes affirm the unity of religious identification and action in students' religious attitudes. The significant positive correlation between church visit and our model of religious attitudes confirm how personal sentiments contribute to one's religious identity. Related studies previously show the youth negotiate their religious attitude, religious identity. Religiosity is expressed in terms of commitments towards personal well-being and social order instead of the traditional performance of religious obligations. This attribution characterizes in a more particular way what previous studies call the shift from religion towards privatized forms among the young especially by uh, studies by Davy, Grace Davy, uh, in 1990 and others. The third dimension also affirmed the significant link between ethical and religious views in contrast to a previous work by Parbotea et al. in 2008. From these findings, we see student religious attitudes intersecting with moral, civic, political, and social commitments. They bridge deep-seated religious convictions with social and moral life, affirming a previous study by Stavrova and Seegers in 2014 in a context where religion is socially endorsed generally. Hence, the findings suggest that while faith for them is increasingly personal, it is never socially indifferent but committed to social life in matters of faith. Next, we shall show how Catholic youth religious identification supports various student engagements as a function of leadership. Our findings and a recent study of Filipino students in Southern Philippines consistently show youth religious attitudes can be predisposing factors 
to pro-social commitments. The results suggest that Catholic youth engagements as a function of leadership is correlated to religious identification. We make sense of our empirical findings with recent literature following Osmer's framework for practical theological interpretation to show the promise and contours of youth leadership engagements in Philippine church life. Elkington et al. in 2015 identified Osmer's four questions in the following areas of reflection. Descriptive empirical, primarily inquiring about the current context from empirical and qualitative sources. The interpretive category investigates the fundamental reasons why things are happening. Normative questions raise desired ideals from theology. Pragmatic questions are interested in actions to be taken to reach the desired order. Framed in Osmer's theological frame, we show how religious identity is foundational to specific youth the involvements in community engagements in general, in catechesis, and ecological advocacy. Under descriptive empirical, the current Philippine church realities point to youth engagements in community, catechesis, and environmental advocacies. The actual experiences of Catholic youth volunteers in the Philippines show how they can be potent forces to realize church mission among the poor communities. Our analysis of current literature helps us to understand student engagements as these affirm the following. First, religious attitudes determine pro-social behavior. Second, there is a correlation between Catholic identity and pro-environmental attitudes. Third, Youth religious identity go beyond religion. Fourth, moral and social views are also commitments to faith. And last is, religious attitudes are materials for moral global citizenship. Wilson and Janowski in 1995 affirm the link between religious affiliation and church involvement among youth adults. Young adults. The link supports a previous study which noted how college students appreciate their catechetical engagements in public schools. This strategy of incorporating students' service in the religious education curriculum appeared to work in favor of student learning. In addition, Paris-based volunteer catechists can work towards a triple catechetical renewal which includes renewed catechesis, renewed worship, and renewed social apostolate, as cited in Eusebio 2011, page 10. In terms of environmental care, Filipino youth engagement signify favorable outcomes through environmental preservation and consciousness, raising Catholic youth engagements with ecological issues or environmental advocacies in the country Beginning to take shape. Baring and Molino in 2021 cited how environmental awareness and religious attitudes are linked. Recently, recently formed lay organizations such as Living Laudato Si Philippines and Laudato Si Generation Philippines are interested in promoting concrete actions inspired by the message of Pope Francis' encyclical on preserving the earth. Our study on Christian environmentalism showed how the informants comprising mostly Christians look up to a theocentric view of the environment showing the central role of God as creator of the world, sanctity of nature, and human moral responsibility. For the interpretive com component, what explains the link between religious identity and youth engagements within and outside the school context. Like the church, educational institutions play significant roles in steering the Catholic youth for social development. The Catholic Bishops' Conference of the Philippines views Catholic youth 
as beloved, gifted, and empowered with a mission. The relevance of educational institutions is emphasized no less when examining the interplay of education, religion, and leadership. For Murphy, religious principles and values are essential to academic and public life. Hill and Dalk, in 2013, affirm how religion and education can independently help to sustain civic volunteerism over time. One local study likewise found highly favorable views towards Catholic affiliation and social engagements. Under the normative component, the Catholic social teachings explicitly exhort Catholics to, to engage with the world. They offer well-developed perspective on social issues or social justice that encourages Catholics to practice civic engagement. As cited from Hill and Hill, 2008, page 98. These teachings introduce principles that endorse values shared by educational institutions. The challenge posed by religious and cultural diversities propose new forms of community engagements for Philippine religious education. Catholic educational institutions are communities of renewal, as cited by CDCP 1992 under the Second Plenary Council of the Philippines, and venues for the cultivation of service and development of future leaders. They are instruments of world renewal and instruments of cultural progress for individual and for society. Under the pragmatic component, social transformation is at the heart of the Church's evangelizing mission, service through community engagements, catechetical ministry, and environmental advocacies offer opportunities for young Catholics to participate in Church mission. Service forms the basis of genuine and authentic leadership in Catholic schools. Citing Gutierrez, Baring noted how experiences of marginalization rationalize Catholic education's involvement with the poor through community engagement, welfare programs, technical training programs, advocacies, and charity works from Baring 2015. These areas for involvement in effect, spell out opportunities for growth where students can show their abilities to contribute toward community transformation. To sustain this commitment, Philippine Catholic schools introduce Catholic social teaching in their lessons to educate students about the commitment of faith toward society and inform them about areas for social engagements. Localized Catholic youth initiatives organized through the Episcopal Commission on Youth show long traces of actual youth engagements in real environmental concerns. These include the Student Catholic Action, Young Christian Workers, and Catholic Youth Organizations in Campus and Off Campus. As part of youth engagements for the formation of fellow youth, the Episcopal Commission on Youth Objectives and Goals direct youth ministry towards community engagement and the interest generated from these engagements are only beginning to grow. More practical engagements remain to be seen. In conclusion, in the present study, we covered religious identity in terms of affiliation and attendance with respect to church and community engagements using OSMER's framework. Our data showed how Catholic youth religious identity may predispose pro-social commitments from our own sample. So thank you for listening and uh, good evening. Thank you, Dr. Barring and Dr. Molina. This was a really nuanced account of the complicated relationship between religious belonging and believing and the way it's uh, connected to social engagement and social transformation in the Philippines. So I look forward to sort of probing some of the questions you raised for us uh, after all the presentations are done. And I also want to uh, invite all the audience to submit their questions. There is a Q&A uh, sort of rubric uh, 
on your Zoom screens. And so please, as you're listening to presentations, feel free to send questions uh, to us. Um, I now want to uh, introduce our second speaker this morning who is joining us from Uganda, uh, Father Charles Senyondo. Um, Father Senyondo is the chair of Dogmatic Systematic Theology and sets at St. Mary's National Seminary Gaba. He has a doctorate in sacred theology from uh, the University of St. Mary of the Lake near Chicago. He is a co-author of the Valigo Journal, a philosophical and theological journal published by Uganda National Seminaries, uh, building on his past experience as a teacher at a high school seminar uh, and as a chaplain of two big neighboring high schools. He still takes part in the training and mentoring of young people in this, um, in this uh, youth encountering the Serious Center, which is a youth, youth center in the Archdiocese of Kampala. Uh, the title of his today's contribution is Catholic Youth in a Relativistic World. Dr. Sunyanda. Hello, hello everyone. Um, okay, thank you so much for sharing my, my screen. I'm so happy I can say uh, to be part of this theological week. It is the first for me, and I don't know whether there is any other Ugandan who has participated. If there is, then I'm happy to be the next. And I come from Uganda, as you can see, uh, they have introduced me, and uh, Uganda is in East Africa. Um, can I go to another? Next. Uh, okay. Okay, thank you so much. Um, my uh, Uganda is in um, East Africa, and Uganda is 85% uh, Catholic. I mean, not Catholic, but Christian. And uh, of the 85, about 33 are Catholics. And um, those Catholics and Uganda as, as, as large, and in large, large um, we are about 70% below 30 years. So you can imagine the population of about 40, uh, 40 million people, about 70% are below 30, which means they are young people. And, and, and these young people uh, fill the churches on a, uh, almost a daily basis. And on Sundays, they are full of churches. So we still have a vibrant church and a young church. Uganda is also um, a, a country of the martyrs. 22 Catholic Uganda martyrs who were martyred in the 19th century, 1886, seven years after the Catholic faith came to Uganda. And most of these were youth. Actually, I think about 18 were below 30 years of age. So the young people have a very good example in, uh, in Uganda, uh, of the Uganda martyrs, uh, whom we celebrate on every June 3rd. A million people gather in Namugongo to celebrate the Uganda martyrs from all over the world. And of course, you, you're going to find most of the people there are young people. But yeah, listen, as uh, my topic as was introduced is the Catholic youth or the youth or the young people in the relativistic world. Relativism, I can say, is that attitude where everyone has the truth or everyone knows what to do. It determines the good and the right and the wrong, depends on an individual. I'm not saying it for the sake of, um, or, or for a negative, uh, it's not for negative sense, but for what to bring out what is exactly uh, taking place in the world. So my, my paper is to try to make a, 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 a a diagnosis of the whole, the world as as we see it today, how the world is. As according to my topic, I tend to see the world today as as characterized by relativism, 
not necessarily in a negative sense, but uh, the objective, um, there is an objective shift, a shift from the objective to the subjective or relativistic perception of everything. This is where the church finds herself. And this is the church which the youth are inheriting. The question now is, how can they be Christian and carry on with the centuries long Christian doctrines amidst a changing world? That is the question I'm trying to answer and try to, to diagnose another. Can we go to another? Thank you. Another slide. Let's go to another slide. Okay, we are living in a society where the individual tends to be the source and summit of the truth of the good and the bad and the right and the wrong. As Christians who have learned, maybe we can go back a little bit. As Christians who have learned to, to police our own values, our own values. Uh, excuse me, um, the slides are kind of mixed up here. May I try to share my screen with you? Um, Which slide do you need me to go to? Um, slightly better. Okay, behind that. The previous slide. Oh, can okay? I go to a previous? Okay, are we there? Okay, thank you so much. Our age today, our age today tends to stand towards wonders. If we are living in a generally pluralistic society, why have our society trying to, uh, to, to shut down, to suppress the Christian values and identity? And that's what we are seeing in our society. Next slide. Next slide. There seems to be a crisis of faith where absolute truth and universal norms and values are being suppressed and replaced by subjective and relative ones and systematically ensuring that this, the objective ones never come back into play. Our age is an age of relativism. Now I would like to go to the church and the youth over the years. What has the church done to accommodate the youth church? The magisterium has always read, been read, ready and um, brought the, and labored to bring the youth on board to embrace the gospel in the midst of paradigm shifts. It has done this through engaging the young church as to ensure a future that is consistent with the truth. One of the greatest figures to be closer to the youth is blessed John Paul II. He is the one who started um, the youth, uh, International Youth Days. And uh, in one of the youth days, actually, um, he said this, in communion with the whole people of God, on the, just the great jubilee of the year 2000, I want to invite you this year, he's inviting the youth to fix your eyes on Jesus, teacher and Lord of life with the help of the words recalled in John's gospel. Teacher, where are you staying? 
And the teacher replied, come and see. And so that was the mission of John Paul II. He wanted to bring the youth to Jesus to come and see. Now in our, in our life as human beings, we would like to see in order to believe. We see that right from uh, after the resurrection, the, the disciples did not believe that Jesus had risen until they went to the tomb. They did not, did not believe Mary Magdalene's testimony. They wanted to go and they went and saw and believed. And when the disciples also told uh, Thomas that they had seen the Lord, Thomas did not believe until he saw the Lord and touched him and then he believed, my Lord and my God. Now, the question is, what are the youth seeing today? Youthfulness is a curiosity and dynamism. And what is there in the church that arouses the curiosity of young people today? What is there to see? What is, to, what is so inviting in the church that attracts young people? How is the moral fabric of the old church? Those are the questions we need to answer. Now I would like to go to the future church in John Allen's mind. Next, uh, next slide. John Allen gives us 10 trends which he says will characterize the church, the future church. But from these 10, I would like to pick only three, which I think very, very important. And the three, one, a word church. The church, as we realize, is no longer a world church as it was in the Middle Ages. Faith, religion, and theology were still a priority. In our times, the universality of the church is shrinking and will continue to shrink. Pope Benedict the 16th stated this, that the church of tomorrow will be a church that has lost much. She will become small and will have to start afresh, more or less from the beginning. He said this way back in 1969 on a German radio. So the church is shrinking, it's no longer a world church. Those are some of the challenges the youth are finding. Now, the modern times made it worse. And the 20th century also made it even further worse. Evangelical Pentecostal and the Pentecostal movements are also making it even worse. They're eating deep into the numbers of the Catholic faith and the church. And the main target are the youth. What is there to protect and to aid these youth to remain Christian and Catholic? A second uh, trend that John gives us is Islam. He states it that Islam will nearly equal Christianity by the year 2050 before eclipsing it around 2070. Now, it is natural for people to identify with the more, the better, and the powerful. Now, we shall realize that people will go with the more, the better, and the powerful. If Islam eclipses Christianity, shall we still have the Catholics in our church? And then the third I would like to bring out from John Allen's mind is globalization. There is a temptation of integrating all things, economics, politics, faith, and so on. And common interests and values are promoted to the detriment of the particular ones. The youth may, may think that Catholic particular values are less important and all obsolete because the word tends to fuse them together. My dear friends, now allow me to go to another point where is the, the, the breakdown of society and the family. 
as society becomes more individualistic, materialistic, and disconnected, despite being a global village, the family of God, the church, is also not spared. Faith has become an individual issue, and Christians are increasingly becoming cafeteria Christians. Now, in this situation, overtones of racial, national, and congregational and continental identification are louder than ever. So how can we now read the Lord's last prayer that they may all be one? That is a, a question that we have to answer. The youth, we have to help the, answer, the, the youth to answer. And then another is the loss of Catholic scholasticism. Now scholasticism of the Middle Ages is dying away. Faith and theology are no longer the hinges of education. In many countries, the Catholic populace are theologically ignorant. Like in my country, Uganda, maybe like less than one percent of the Catholic theological reflections and profound preaching has been overtaken by rhetoric and inspirational speeches. There is need for Catholic renaissance and renewed scholasticism, now keeping in mind that the church has stood firm for all these years, not on charisms of individuals, but on profound and sound doctrine. And that's what we are losing. And now let me go to the mushrooming new ecclesial communities. The question is, can we still speak of a church or churches? These new ecclesial communities are appealing and their appealing nature poses a challenge to the young Catholics. In addition to preaching a prosperity gospel, they tend to preach a gospel of niceness and non-judgmental. It is like their journey is one that never tires, a rest that never ends, a joy without limit, a slope that never sends. Most people today want a religion which suits the way they live rather than one which makes demands upon them. A religion that has become a luxury like an opera, not a responsibility like life. They have been quoting the blessed uh, Fulton Sheen. Another uh, challenge is the economic factor in the religious world. The church is becoming more and more economized. There is permeative desire for economic prosperity by the leadership of the church. Like during King Saul's time, people wanted to be like other nations the prosperity, the, the, the propensity for breakthroughs, the urge to get rich, to get it easy, is increasing, even in church leaders. Young people are watching when the priest indulges in riches, when he spends more time in, in, in cervical games other than saving souls, when his heart and eyes see money easier than the suffering, when he considers reduction of church attendance in terms of loss of revenue than loss of faith, when he is more concerned about his pay and privileges than his responsibilities, and when his job is more of a career than a vocation. That is affecting the faith of the youth today. It's another challenge, the economic factor. Now there is also conservatism vis-a-vis -vis progressive Catholicism. For many people today, the Catholic church seems to be an outdated institution that is stuck in the middle ages. Universal values I bother to many. Those who still hold them are quickly named conservatives, annoying and ignorant. Hence, the divide between conservative and progressive Christians continues to widen. And the age of faith has given a giveaway, gave way to age of reason 
and the age of reason gave way to age of feelings. That is according to Fulton Sheen. That's a very big challenge today. And another challenge is, <clears throat> excuse me, another slide. Um, the, the conservatives versus pro progressive Catholicism is continuing. So the great Catholic scholars help us to understand the gravity of the matter. Let me begin by Fulton Sheen. He says this, it may take a long time for Western civilization to realize that the good it is seeking the good is the good that is it left, even if I stop there. And then um, Pope Benedict the 16th says this, many young people today are tossed about by every wind of doctrine in their journey from old to new and better expression of their faith. Can they still be true Catholics? That's another challenge. Another challenge is the imperative need. Oh, there is an imperative need to address sensitive moral issues. There are no clear cut answers to these issues. No one is bold enough to come up with a plain no or yes. Everyone seems to play safe and be politically correct, protecting self and not safeguarding the truth, being either non-committal or vague or take sides. Now the problem with the church leaders, me inclusive, is that we hate being hated. We, bear, we better stay quiet or take sides instead of standing by the truth. With all these challenges in our, in our presence before us, before the young people today, what could be the remedies? I find the Christus vivid apostolic exaltation as the way forward for the young people today. This exaltation by Pope Francis offers a sense of direction for young people in the contemporary world. If it is studied very well and taught to every young people everywhere in the world, it can lead young people to a good direction. You know, it says, Pope Francis says, Christ is alive and he wants you to be alive. He wants the youth to be alive. They should not live as if they are dead. No recourse to scripture. You know, eight Old Testament examples are given. For example, Saul, David, Solomon, all these were young people and pushing along salvation history. They never gave up on their faith. And Jesus' message to young people in the New Testament is also very paramount. Jesus himself was young. Mary was a young girl. And there are so many young people, the disciples, most of them were young people, but they kept going despite the challenges. Jesus is ever young and, and holy and is inviting also the young people to be those young and holy people. He wants them to be the now of God Young people all over the world have challenges. Men are going through tough and difficult lives. In my country, Uganda, I've been to the youth, no jobs, nothing. They, they, they don't have what to eat. They, 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 there are so many challenges, but they should remain with Christ. They need to be listened to. These people need to be listened to. They also need to listen to Jesus because Jesus is the answer. So this uh, exaltation offers very wonderful um, solutions to young people to remain Catholics today. Another, there are three truths that this exaltation gives us. God is love. We, we, God is love and we, the young people must embrace this love and take it to one another because there is no love anywhere else greater than that of God. And Jesus' salvation is the salvation is the true salvation because we cannot be saved in any other name but in Jesus' name. And so people, young people need to come and continue a life in Jesus and his message. That's another wonderful uh, 
solution to all uh, the young people's challenges. Then another way forward that this exhortation gives uh, the lives with Jesus, to live with Jesus. To, the young people should have path, uh, paths that are in congruence with Jesus' path. No youthful years are a time of decision, a time of energy, a time of hope and expectation, a time thirsting, thrust, thirsting for new experiences, a time of fraternity, a time of growth. So the youth are encouraged to leave it all with Jesus as a personal friend because he was a youth and he knows what they are going through. They should walk in his path. That's another wonderful solution to all this. And young people with the roots, they, know, they need to have roots. Young people, the Pope uh, advises that they should not live abstract from the rest of the world. They should, uh, no, we are living in a council culture. Many young people think uh, the, uh, the, young, the old culture is abs obsolete. It is dead. Instead, these people, they ought to live in a connection with their cultures and the older people around them to guide them. They should listen to them and follow their example because they have the experience and experience is the best teacher. Youth ministries, this uh, gives us how we can approach youth ministries, many good programs which should work in harmony. He gives examples of young people as agents should work together, need both outreach and personal growth, need to be rooted in our culture and family. Church needs to reach out to where youth are. Need, there is need to form leaders among the youth. The youth should be missionaries and the older people have a duty to, pros, to properly accompany the youth wherever they go. They should not abandon them as a kind of a, a, a spoiled generation. That is um, a temptation. And um, I'm about to come to an end. Um, may I go to the conclusion? Okay, before you go to the conclusion, Jesus, I mean, the Pope also invites the people, the youth to come to vocational discernment, listening uh, uh, to, to Jesus and listening and listening to their hearts, what they want to do for God and their people. They should discern what they want to be, not only religious vocations, but also vocations, marriage vocations, and all other vocations that involve serving God and his people. Any conclusion? I would like to conclude like this. The future church needs the ancient church to remain Christian. The rare mirror is more important in avoiding wrong turns. It is small, but can be more important than the windscreen. The older church needs to be a good listener, listening and accompanying the youth. And the word of God and the Holy Spirit are the eternal guides for the church to walk to eternity. And last but not least, I would like to thank you all for listening and um, thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Father uh, Senyondo. Uh, this was a really, uh, I think quite stimulating um, um, interpretation of the ways in which subjectivism and relativism can also lead to increased intolerance. It would be very, I would be personally very interested to hear how the Christian notion of love can help uh, alleviate some of the challenges of this sort of intolerance and shape the spirit of the time, but also uh, faith formation among the youth. So again, I want to encourage the audience to submit their questions uh, using the Q&A uh, rubric on your Zoom screens, and uh, we'll be able to address those questions after all the presentations are completed. Uh, at this point, I want to uh, turn to introducing our third speaker uh, today who is joining us from Panama. And this is Father Joseph Fitzgerald. He 
He's originally from Philadelphia. Uh, he was ordained in 2005 in the Congregation of the Mission Vincentians and has since ministered among the indigenous Nobe people of Panama. Uh, the ministry that included uh, accompanying the Nobe people in the struggle to maintain their cultural identity and defend their lands. Father Fajold has served as executive secretary of the National Coordination of Indigenous Ministry of the Panamian Bishops Conference since 2016. And in this capacity, he was a principal organizer for the first World Indigenous Youth Gathering as a pre-event to World Youth Day uh, 2019 in Panama. Uh, Father Fitzgerald holds a PhD in theology from the Pontificate Bolivarian University in Colombia and is the author, I'm going to say it in English, of the book uh, entitled Dance in the House of Noble, Resilience of the Nobe Full Life in the Face of Neoliberalism. Father Fitzgerald's presentation is titled Taking Charge of Their Roots, Indigenous Youth Leadership in Church and Society. Uh, which is very much uh, echoing also the, the, the sort of the theme, the tropes of uh, Pope Francis's um, encyclical uh, Fratelli Tutti. So, part of a job. Just give me a moment to set up. You can just let me know if I'm if I'm visible there. We can see it. We are all okay. Fine. Great. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, for the opportunity to participate in in this uh, in this conference. Thanks to uh, to Father Bill and Karen and everybody there at the the Center for World Catholicism and Intercultural Theology. As mentioned, I'm a Vincentian missionary here in Panama since 2005, uh, working amongst the indigenous Nobe people, and I'll be speaking to the vision of. Uh, indigenous youth leadership, particularly from the, the Nobe perspective. And so just as a disclaimer, I'm not indigenous. Uh, hopefully what I present is the fruit, uh, presented well of the fruit of the indigenous youth here, uh, the, the Nobe. If I make any mistakes, that's my own fault. And I apologize to you as well as to the, to the Nobe youth. I'd like to begin with, uh, with an image. After eight days uh, after birth, the umbilical cord uh, of the birth of the child is planted with a strong seed, such as the, the, the seed of a mango tree, uh, the seed of a tree that's gonna go strong. And the umbilical cord, the, the part of this child at their birth then forms part of the roots of this tree. And as the tree grows, the tradition for the elders, the, the parents, the grandparents is to periodically call the child or the young person's attention to this strong tree and to say, you're part, uh, you're part of this, you grow as this tree grows, and you always know that you're to grow strong and you always know where you've come from because you're part of this land. I use that image uh, with this talk as mentioned, which is uh, titled Taking Charge of Their Roots, Indigenous Youth Leadership in the Church and Society. And this title comes from a message of Pope Francis to indigenous Catholic youth gathered here in, in Panama three years ago. Because indigenous youth face particular challenges in encountering spaces for serving in leadership. Uh, in the struggle to maintain their cultural values, practices, communal identity, and simultaneously confront the pressures to assimilate into a wider individu individualistic and, and consumer-driven culture. So we're exploring a particular vision of indigenous Nobe youth, of what they maintain as a vision of good indigenous leadership, the ob obstacles they encounter, as well as some signs of hope, finishing with a few examples. So I'll give a brief mention to the context of indigenous peoples, in the church and society, characteristics of indigenous leadership, some models of Nobe leadership and, and, and challenges. And this comes from a study here with the indigenous Nobe youth. And then as I mentioned, finish with some examples. But before uh, speaking about indigenous youth leadership, it's just worth mentioning the context. I'm here in Panama, at Central America, Mesoamerica, uh, which was colonized uh, by the Spanish and then went into process of, of post-colonial uh, political organization and eventually nation states that we live in today. 
And we know that the residual effects and, uh, of colonialism are still with us and, and are, in, are pre present as a, as a main challenge for a lot of young people. As Pope Francis states in Querida Amazonia, the, the history of such suffering and contempt does not easily heal and colonialism has not ended. In many places it's been changed, disguised, concealed while losing none of its contempt for the life of the poor and the fragility of the environment. And so it's in that context of a movement towards a more intercultural society and intercultural church where all cultures are respected and valued and understood that we kind of try to focus this talk. And to give the summary of the first part, because the first part uh, is what the youth have constructed is the characteristics that a Nobe leader uh, should live and practice. I'm gonna stop sharing screen and ask uh, that we share the brief video about three minutes of Emil de Santos, Montezuma. So, Balo, if we could share that video. Emil de Santo Montezuma, de la etnia Nove Bugle, Panama. Las características principales que debe de tener un líder Nove o indígena deberían ser lo primordial, mantener siempre su identidad, su identidad, su origen, mantener su linaje y un ideal por el cual ejercerá el liderazgo dentro de los dentro dentro de los pueblos indígenas como indígena. Es fundamental que nosotros como líderes o el que ejerce el liderazgo mantenga siempre el contacto, mantenga siempre la escucha con los pueblos frente a las realidades que viven actualmente y, y, el, y el cambio que día a día eh, hay en la sociedad. Eh, uno de, y otras características también fundamental es que el, los líderes puedan estar siempre en constante aprendizaje, tanto en temas políticos, económicos, ambientales. Es fundamental ya que en los tiempos cambian y las realidades son diferentes y es, y es por eso que como líderes debemos estar siempre aprendiendo, comunicándonos, caminando y escuchando. Tener ese poder y la habilidad de escuchar, de entender a la sociedad, de entender los problemas sociales y cómo poder resolver también lo principal, cómo vamos a resolver como líderes indígenas, cómo vamos a aportar positivamente a solucionar los diferentes conflictos o realidades día a día. Otra de las características que también tenemos que tener como, como líderes y recordar siempre es conocer la historia de nuestros líderes y, 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 y ver en ellos la capacidad que tuvieron como líderes de dar su vida por su pueblo, de luchar, de tener un ideal y no renunciar a ello. Igual nosotros debemos como líderes seguir eh, cumpliendo con eso, con ese compromiso que ejercemos al, al momento de liderar nuestro pueblo, una organización o un grupo. Es fundamental siempre también mantenernos fuertes frente a las diferentes manipulaciones, sean políticas, económicas, siempre eh, eh, mantenernos firmes frente a estas cosas que pueden llevarnos a tomar otras decisiones negativas y, y, y bajarnos y, y, y tumbar nuestro objetivo principal, que sería defender y luchar hasta dar la vida por nuestro pueblo, qué es lo que esperan ellos, qué es lo que en el momento donde llegamos a ser líderes, es eso lo que ellos esperan como pueblo de nosotros. Ellos esperan que nosotros podamos cumplir con ese deber de luchar, de dar nuestra vida, si es posible, como líderes, para que se logre el objetivo por el cual se está luchando. And so as mentioned by, by Emil, the, the participants emphasize the importance that a leader should be rooted in their culture, have their identity, that they should uh, be, be walking with others, building consensus, demonstrating firmness and, and integrity in the relationship with outside entities, which is always a, a, a difficult piece. 
to not be manipulated by temptations for personal gain outside of their own context. And here we have some of the words of, of the youth. And the, the, the image of the defender, and this is part of the post-colonial reality, uh, that a lot of times the, the relationship with governments and outside ent entities is in protecting the people, protecting the rivers, the forests, in front of the extraction industry, the governments involved in transnational corporations. And that there's also a constant process of learning. And so the youth were asked about some images. Who, who embodies this reality that they spoke of? And they began talking about images and, and, and uh, people from the mythical and oral tradition, including uh, the semi-divine Sukhya Kenna, who led all the people through a four-day eclipse of the sun uh, when, when, when the earth was kind of transformed and the ability of everyone to listen to him, come together, to go to the designated sites, to, to work together, including with all the animals, and find salvation by working together under the guide of a, of a of a leader. It's, it's the repeated theme of, of the mythical leader is the one who guides everyone to salvation by working together and the leader often dies. But in, talk, in talking about some historical, here I have the image of two uh, relatively recent uh, Nobel leaders, Delia Besigo, uh, Delia Bejerano Besigo, who in 1962, uh, claims to have had a vision of Jesus and Maria, uh, Jesus and Mary, uh, calling for a look inward of the culture. And this happened at a critical moment in the history of the Nobe because they had started to migrate off of Nobe lands for migrant work. And then coming back had different cultural practices, uh, had different kind of vision of the way things should be. Individualism started to come in. And so Besico and this, uh, the, the proposed uh, prophecy was a turn in. It was a bit radicalized in the sense of uh, not sending children to formal school, not speaking Spanish, not using Western medicine, and was also apocalyptic. Um, but what the message did do is call the Nobe to look inward and value their culture as something worth defending. Jose Monica Cruz, uh, coming from this movement of Vesigo and what became the Mama Tata uh, religion or faith, started to call all the Nobe together for large congresses and they elected Monica Cruz as the first chief. And he realized that cultural isolation wasn't going to serve the people, that they should try to work to get their designated land and see the interaction they had to have with government entities. So even though he wasn't recognized in any formal way, for the Nobe, he was the chief. And without being formally recognized, his method was protest. Large walks across the country, uh, camping outside the presidential palace, being jailed several times, until he was able in 1997 uh, gain Nobe land of what we call the Comarca here in Panama or what you would call a reservation in other places like the United States. One of his common phrases is there that we are all Congress. If we die, to, if we die, we die together. If we live, we live together. And so we can summarize the importance of these figures that the youth look to as, as two very important figures in that Pesigo helped the Nobe identifies his distinct people with a culture and value to be protected. And Cruz realized that isolation would ultimately not ben be beneficial or realistic and understood his role as mediating on behalf of the interests of the Nobe with outside entities in a more pluralistic context. So the youth were asked about the challenges they face looking at these characteristics and looking at these proposed leaders. And we look at it at three levels, the local context within their own communities, the pluricultural context is to say with, with the non-indigenous uh, culture of, of Panama, and then in the church context. And looking at the local context, there was an intense feeling of, of inadequacy, of not being connected to their roots, uh, of not being able to manage uh, the cultural, the values, the history. And part of this comes from the reality of the positive advance of formal education in rural areas has the negative effect of removing children and youth from the traditional Nobe educational context. Oral traditions, history, rituals, rites of passage, along with previous uh, universal knowledge, such as cultivating the land and, and the use of natural medicines, are no longer transmit, transmitted in traditional means. 
Another weakness that the youth felt is a, is a change from a, a we mentality or identity to an I mentality. It's broader than the youth. It's, it, it's, it's broader in that Nobe culture and th that can be noted as the years go by. But the, note, the youth noted this as a, as a weakness that the, the communal identity and working together isn't as strong as it was uh, in previous generations. And for them as leaders, it presents a difficulty and, a, and a, a lack of ability to resolve internal conflicts. When then talking about being leaders outside uh, being indigenous youth, but outside of their, their internal context, there's other uh, challenges that are presented uh, in, in terms of a context of, of discrimination and, and racism. And what they would speak of primarily as the pressure to assimilate or to deny their indigenous identity entering other uh, other contexts. And then this is this uh, kind of ever-present image of what success means. And this starts very early in, in the education process. That is the, nobody you'd see it, this, the successful person is the one who denies their indigenous identity to assume everything from the outside, kind of an upward mobility, um, non-indigenous identity has always been presented to them as the successful, uh, it's the image of, of, of where they should be aspiring to. And so that's a, a difficult difficulty for them in terms of exercising leadership. In the, in the short context, uh, there's the lack of, of not only uh, cultural identity and, and practice, but also in faith, ma faith matters. A sad reality in contemporary Nobe culture is with a plurality of, of religious uh, affiliations and practices, sometimes a strong faith leader of a particular denomination or, or faith group might be seen as divisive. Being in, in the forefront as a faith leader means being at, in service of a particular group. And so moving outside of the, of the church context, uh, sometimes they, they feel there's a fear of being criticized uh, in that sense. But there's also within the, the Catholic church itself that going outside, let's say the indigenous lands where they're, where they're practicing their Catholic faith and being in a, in a, in a, in a context with non-indigenous Catholics, they feel like they're not understood and that it becomes another scenario of assimilation where they can't practice their faith as they were accustomed to, which comes from their ancestral relationship with, with the one God in his fulfillment in, in, in the gospel of Jesus. So I'll go into a couple of examples. And I wanna begin with the, an image again. And this image is of the traditional Nobe Hegi dance. Because Hegi is the ancestral ritual dance of the Nobe. It begins with four sacred songs sung by the, 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 the ritual singer to open the road is the way it's, it's described in the, in the language. And the dance begins with the leader indicating the steps with the maraca. And this leader is called uh, the head of the road. And their task is to guide the group through repetitive moments for long periods of time. Sometimes the Hegi dance is called for four consecutive days. And it's to dance together until all the participants are kind of lost in the experience and moving as one body. The various steps uh, mimic animal movements as well as climactic events. And it's an essential part of uh, the tradition of, of naming a child, the adolescent rite of passage, as well as other important moments in, in Nobe life. The Hegi dance, along with traditional dress and, and even the face painting, that accompany it has become very synonymous with Nobe youth leadership. And in my observation, this occurred because of the central role that the Hagi dance played in the 2012 Nobe anti-mining protests. The Nobe for 40 years had been struggling to stop the initiatives of the various governments and international corporations to open mineral mines in the Nobe lands. And in 2012, they successfully shut down the Inter-American Highway at various points for five days, paralyzing the country and forced the country, to uh, the government, to sign a special environmental protection law for their territory, which includes the complete prohibition of mineral mines. And this resistance movements and, and the, the protests themselves proved to be a formative experience for the Nobe youth. Uh, it was a process of defending their territory and in that recommitting to their identity. The question started to rise of what does it mean as ind indigenous youth today to live uh, their culture and their identity? And one of the places over the past decade where this has become very evident is higher education. 
because it's really over the past decade that the Nobi have had more access uh, to higher education and in large numbers, one of the main public universities near here, about 50% or a little more than 50% are now indigenous. So they found this space where they can start to form, uh, they formed what, what are called cultural groups. And in that cultural group, they use a, a Nobe leadership model. It's very based around the, the Hege dance, but it's also uh, started to manifest itself in movements towards change within the universities, looking at structural and systematic change, looking at curriculum change that reflects their, their history and, and interests as, as Nobe youth. And this whole movement has culminated, culminated a few months ago when the government officially signed into law an indigenous autonomous university here in Panama, which has never existed. It's existed in other places such as Mexico and Peru, and Peru. but that is now law and resources will now be put into an autonomous indigenous university, which will have a curriculum, but also structures and of course faculty and, 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 and staff from the different indigenous peoples of Panama. So it's a, it's a civil, it's, a, it's an example in civil society where the youth have taken lead. But I want to move on to the church example. As mentioned here in Panama three years ago, we had the World Indigenous Youth Gathering. And the process itself was a, was a two year program with three main objectives, social and ecclesial inclusion of indigenous youth, the promotion of indigenous youth leadership and raising consciousness in the general population about indigenous youth and their particular way of living our Catholic faith. And so the indigenous youth of Panama, and particularly the Nalbe as the local hosts, were responsible for the decision, the decision making process, uh, the decisions throughout the process, the locality, the themes, the agenda, the image. They formed working groups to, uh, to address the clean water, health, road access, security, which brought them into leadership positions in, in front of government and private entities. And after the two year process was, was organized, uh, we received about 400 pilgrims from throughout, throughout Latin America from more than 40 languages, as well as about 2,000 Nobe that uh, locally that, that participated. And after the opening ceremony, which was based on the Nobe purification ritual, Pope Francis made a surprise appearance by video to address uh, the gathering. And he focused his message on, on what the youths were, were, were celebrating and searching for by inviting them to take charge of the roots, to care for their roots and affirming their indigenous identity and being courageous in this building of this other possible world, which is a, a common phrase amongst indigenous movements as well as indigenous movements with, within the church. Just an interesting note that this focus of taking charge of your roots would then be cited in both uh, Christus Bibi and Querida Amazonia and this indigenous gathering here in Panama was cited by the cardinal in charge of these synods uh, that the indigenous gathering was kind of a bridge gathering because it was, it was youth and it was focused on indigenous and, and, the, and, the, and our common home. So the following days uh, would be mixed with, uh, would be a mix of enculturated prayer experiences, testimonies bearing witness to the difficulties and, and triumphs, the hopes of, of the youth that have come from throughout Latin America. And, Although there was a lived joy of being together and coming to know each other, they also dealt with very weighty and very heavy issues throughout the, the days they spent here. And this enthusiasm then overflowed to Panama City, where all of the pilgrims went to Panama City to participate in World Youth Day. They had a, a part of the city in, in a park that was called the Indigenous Village, where they continued to share their faith, uh, the martyrs uh, of, of, of faith that are particular to the indigenous people here throughout Latin America as well as share their culture and, 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 and their struggles with the non-Indigenous pilgrims. They also had a lot of spaces to participate in World Youth Day and were eventually called up uh, to spend the, the final village with Pope Francis on the main stage. You can see the Nobe youth in the bottom corner there dancing Hege on the main stage of the, of the vigil waiting for Pope Francis to come out. And so although there was a lot of, of, of examples uh, throughout the two years of leadership, I just wanna finish with three quick examples. Uh, one example is, while they were still gathered at the youth uh, gathering in, in the Nobe lands, the president of the country decided to come to make a surprise visit. He didn't announce it, but it was evident because all of his, I like, guess, secret service, if you wanted to say, started to saturate the area. The Nobe youth weren't particularly happy because they thought it was uh, political opportunism. And so wanted to be respectful, but also not wanting to just 
derail the feeling of, of what they were living as a very strong experience of, of, of faith and, and, and justice, they decided amongst themselves to hold a silent protest, that they would just not react and then would just give the president the press communication that they had. The president did not come because of a massive blackout in Panama City, which kind of alleviated the environment uh, after that. Uh, when they got to Panama City, they were invited to speak at the press conference in the, at a large convention center in front of the international press and decided to send uh, two Nobe women to read that press release that they had prepared. When they arrived at the convention center and the press release was read by the committee, uh, the press committee of, of World Youth Day, uh, there was hesitation because the, the communication was pretty strong in denouncing injustices by, uh, by certain governments in terms of indigenous people. Eniti Gedibili, who we, who we see here in this photo, demonstrating uh, indigenous leadership and consensus and in and, and defense of their people said they would not change a word, they would not leave anything out. This was the word of the collective and it was gonna be all of this or it was gonna be none. And so the, the World News Press Committee backed off and said, no, you can read that. And they read it. And then afterwards spent about two hours doing uh, interviews about the different issues that they had presented in terms of, of, of faith, culture, and, and, and other issues. And I end with this. Emilda that we, we heard from earlier, spent two years working full time here in the office for the World Indigenous Youth Gathering. She made several visits to Panama City that coincided with the visit of Vatican officials to explain the importance of this for indigenous youth throughout Latin America and the world. As the World Youth Day event came closer, she was invited by the Vatican and World Youth Day Committee to have lunch with Pope Francis, along with other youth representatives. She would represent indigenous youth of the world and the youth of Latin America. She decided to go uh, full, full dress to, to meet with the Pope and apparently in her intervention with the Pope, she left, a long, she left a strong impression. Later in the day when Pope Francis was meeting with the Jesuits of Central America, he spoke of her and he said that there was a, a, a young indigenous woman in full dress that some people may have looked down on for, for, for her decision to come dressed like that. But when she spoke, Pope Francis said, she gave a good thrashing to those who do not respect Mother Earth. That young woman spoke from her culture with such intellectual capacity that in the end, when the press office asked me who they should take for interviews, I said, take whoever you want, but take her, yes, her, because she will say what no one else will say. This young Catholic woman had not lost her culture. She had made it grow. This is what I want to say. We must enculturate ourselves to the end. I believe Amilda realized that her identity was integral to her message, the message from the youth that she took. Her ancestral traditions were sewed into the design of her Nawa dress, the designs on her face tied her to a specific land, a specific people. She forcibly spoke of what her people had lived through and died for, the respect for and search for harmony in her common home. And she gave the opportunity for Pope Francis to affirm once again, an expression he has repeated throughout his pontificate, that indigenous people have much to teach us. So it's with that, I go back to that image at the beginning of the umbilical cord being planted to grow with the roots of a strong tree. And these words of Pope Francis and his message to the youth, using the image of everything that fruits and blossoms from a tree comes from having strong roots, roots that grow towards the future, and that this is the challenge that awaits them. I think we can affirm that indigenous youth have accepted this challenge in the midst of many difficulties and obstacles, have found strength in deepening their ancestral roots, traditions, values, and ways of leading. So I just leave us with a few of their words that we can listen to and take to heart. Therefore, we the indigenous youth united in one voice demand respect for our diversity, our cosmovisions, and our ways of being manifest in the practices of when we do. We call on governments and societies in general to recognize and demarcate indigenous territories and provide an education that respectful of our peoples, our distinct cultures, ways, richness, and wisdom. And to our beloved church, we ask for the appropriate spaces to live our spiritualities from our cosmovisions, the inheritance of our grandparents, and respect for our particular theologies of our people, fruits of the synthesis between our ancestral faith and the fullness of our hope in the person of Jesus Christ. The time has come to live with joy, the indigenous faith 
of the church. So I thank you all for, for your attention. I apologize for going a few minutes over. And I now hand it back to Slovak as moderator. Thank you very much, uh, Father Fitzgerald. Uh, and I would like to invite all the participants, all the presenters actually to maybe turn on their cameras so we can join uh, um, the audience also for conversation. Uh, I will take the liberty, if that's okay, to ask the first question. We have several questions that are waiting, but I want to pick up on, on a topic, which I think is something that perhaps all of, the, uh, 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 all of our presenters today can address. And this is something I heard especially, but I, again, something throughout all the presentations. And it is a, a sort of relationship or, I, and I'm asking, is it a tension or it's a synergy between uh, sustaining the sense of identity, sustaining sense of origins and history on the one hand, including uh, a tradition, uh, Catholic tradition and Catholic faith, and on the other hand, change and, and uh, openness, uh, uh, imitation as Father Pichol was talking about, to change and learning and listening. And so I'm wondering if, uh, I can ask participants to sort of comment about uh, uh, this. On the one hand, I, mean, I think there's something very characteristic of especially youth, Catholic youth, uh, including um, that on the one hand, there is an awareness that we need to have our roots. On the other hand, there is an awareness also that we need to change or to have hope to speak theologically. So is this a tension or is it a synergy? If I may ask uh, my question that way. Uh, I can invite anybody to comment on it, uh, whoever wants to go first. Maybe Father Fitzgerald may I ask first because oh. you were the one you were the one <laughs> yeah. who perhaps addressed it most yeah. explicitly, or at least it was again throughout uh, yeah. your presentation. Right, I think there's this um, you know it's the understanding. Pope Francis speaks uh, when he speaks about culture, and he speaks about culture not being a museum or not being something static. That culture is, is always in change, and so I think it's one of the um, it's one of the challenges, but it's also one of the gifts, for example, in the context of indigenous youth is to see what it means to, to have their ancestral history and identity, but then what does, what's the best that's offered? I think education is a good example of where, they're, where that's happening. So they're very vested in higher education, but at the same time, they're, they're calling for a higher education and all that means for them and all that means for the good of, 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 of their people and their society um, tied to it but tied to their ancestral uh, faith and identity and then in, in tandem with, with what's offered is in, in, in the current, uh, current society and technology, et cetera. So it's not, a, it's not a traditionalism in terms of like trying to isolate. Uh, and so I think there's very few who would see that. Like I mentioned, there was a moment of that in, in Nobe history about 60 years ago, which was an important moment because it called, an in, it called for an inward identity as, in, as, as a people. But in practice, it was it was quickly changed to kind of this, well, how do we relate to this world that also has very good things to offer? Here we practice traditional uh, ancestral medicine as well as Western medicine. And sometimes the same, you go to the person who's going to do kind of like um, medicinal uh, plants and, and prayers and then go to the health center to see if it's, a, if it's an infection. So it's kind of, it's, it's between these worlds. And I think that the whole, the whole thing of, of how we understand culture when we mean that uh, and understand that culture is always in, in, in process, that culture is never static, is, is an important piece of this to see what are the processes where we should, we should put time and energy. Thank you, Father Fitzgerald. Um, are there any other uh, presenters who would like to comment on this question? Um, yeah, um, I, I think I can uh, give some comment. Uh, I would like to go back to uh, Pope Francis, uh, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, and his book, um, "A People Without Roots." Um, he, he brings us to the realization that uh, our roots are in God. Um, as Christians, our roots are in in, uh, in Jesus, in, in Christianity. Those are we can trace our, our roots there. And so, um, and, and these are affected by, according to me, they are affected by our council culture, uh, whereby we regard everything that is in the past to be obsolete and um, it's no longer important for us. So we need to create something completely new going forward. But uh, in my presentation, I gave uh, an analogy of uh, a rare mirror uh, 
which actually is very important. If you are to make good turns and, and without ac making any accidents, you need to look uh, at what is behind you. I mean, it, it, history will give us a very good uh, understanding of where we are and where we are going, our roots. So we should, um, the future is more important, but we cannot actually neglect the past. We cannot neglect our roots. It's not obsolete. It's very important, it informs us, and then we move and in an in informed direction. Thank you very much, Father Charles. Um, Dr. Baring and Dr. Molino. Uh, from the Philippines, um, uh, we noticed that uh, the young ones, the youth in the Philippines, uh, are kind of finding a new stage of reawakening in faith, so to say. Uh, what we meant, uh, what we mentioned in our paper is that they they never lose their affiliation, their identity, their connection with the institution, although uh, levels of practice and religiosity have gone down, but still they maintain the kind of identification. Meaning to say, the the mindset is very favorable uh, uh, as they look at themselves in relation to their faith, in relation to the institution. Uh, in fact, uh, the good news there is uh, the religious nuns among them is only about 2%. That's very small compared to the other regions. 2% is consistent. And uh, in, in my previous uh, surveys, it has been the consistent number. Uh, so very small. So while, while they affiliate themselves, they, there is a shift in their understanding towards what it means to be religious for them, to be religiously identified for them. And that shift is moving towards uh, ethical, spiritual, and social practices. So in, in that sense, uh, they, they identify themselves as someone who is uh, uh, ethically cold, okay? uh, spiritually cold to, 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 to the community which, to which they are in. No? Um, so it's no longer just me being a Catholic and affiliated with my institution, but me, uh, like, I am called to do something for my community, the bigger community, beyond the institution, beyond the structure, beyond religion, something like that. So it's a reawakening, I think, and, and well, synergy, you might say, yeah, reconnection, so to say, reconnection, yeah, somehow, yeah. And it's, it's not something that, I would say it's not negative, but it's not about losing, but it's more of maybe recovering the new meanings of an old, uh, maybe wisdom that they, uh, they, they receive no? in faith somehow. So that kind of understanding. And I've been seeing that from, from the way they view their uh, religious, their faith, no? religiously. Uh, it's, it's very favorable. So however, it's, it's, it's redefined something ethical spiritual rather than just religious so it's not a it's not a either or either you're religious and not religious but rather it's religious slash being spiritual something like that now it's a fused uh, sense of my identification as a believing person something like that and yeah that's that's what i can say thank you dr marino would you like to add anything or Yes. Um, okay. So being in the field of academe and uh, my encounter with the youth, I could say that uh, synergy is uh, uh, likely uh, um, needed. Uh, the, the young people always uh, looking for dialogue, a kind of uh, dialogue that um, makes them uh, lively and uh, they would like to witness more, especially about their traditional knowledge in terms of, uh, because here in the Philippines, we also have indigenous uh, young people. And uh, more likely, I can say that uh, they would like to witness and uh, be in the presence of their uh, tradition and culture, as well as of their religion. They, would they really love to collaborate for integ integral human development. Of course, now with regards to uh, who do not wish not to become a Christians, and they prefer not to continue to to be in their traditional religions. I could say that. That's uh, I would like to add 
uh, with in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think what I particularly appreciate is the complex account you're giving all of you, because I think there is no simple declension narrative here. There is actually a really complicated relationship between change and tradition and, and the roots. And in a way, uh, Dr. Baring and, and uh, Dr. Molina, you both answered actually the first question that came from Bill Kavanaugh about how these things happen over time. So I'm going to turn to the second question from our audience from Jody Mikalachki. I believe I pr I'm pronouncing it at least closely. Uh, this is a question for Charles, uh, Dr. Senyonda. Could you say more about how youth in Uganda are inspired by the example of the martyrs of, of Uganda? How do they understand the testimony of the martyrs? How do they relate to the martyrs? How does the martyrs witness shape the behavior and commitment of young Ugandans today? Thank you so much. Uh, Uganda, as I said, is a, a country of, the, of martyrs. And um, in the Church of Uganda, the Catholic Church, we emphasize and we evangelization strategies around, or we are helped by the examples of Uganda martyrs. And uh, one of the Uganda martyrs, actually the leader, one of the leaders of the Uganda martyrs was Charles Wanga, and that is um, where I get my name. Charles Wanga was the head, and uh, he was only 22 years. And he's the patron of the youth, the Catholic youth in Uganda. So in our evangelization, we try to help the youth to imitate Charles Wanga with his courage and faith. And you know, he's the one who encouraged his other uh, friends not to, uh, to surrender their faith, but go ahead and die for, for it. And so that courage, that fortitude, that faith of Charles Wanga is very pronounced in all our youth uh, activities. You, you'll find so many Charleses here, <laughs> people called Charles. There are so many uh, associations and youth groups that are under the patronage of Charles Wanga. We lead the literature of the Uganda matters. And by that, we encourage them to keep the faith as the Uganda matters did. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for uh, Father Fitzgerald. Uh, uh, have African indigenous peoples have been involved in world indigenous youth gatherings um, in Central Africa or in Southern Africa and how could they connect and participate? And the second question is, does indigenous dance figure in Catholic liturgies in Panama? If so, how? Okay. Um, the first question, it's a long story how the world indigenous youth gathering started. It was actually gonna be a national gathering and then the bishops actually extended it, and then it, eventually the name became World. And then there was a lot of contact with the Vatican, and noting a weakness, there's not really an office in the Vatican that deals with indigenous peoples. So there was this kind of communication, it became much more Latin America. We did have uh, 10 youth from Botswana uh, at one point registered to come, as well as the, from the Philippines. But then as it got closer, they weren't able to do it financially. So it ended up bec becoming a Latin American gathering, uh, and although it, it held the name of the World Indigenous Youth Gathering. Um, the pandemic has kind of slowed the process of looking how to do a second one. The decision was not to do it in Portugal because it's not a context where, uh, where it can be hosted by indigenous people. So it might at this point be separated from World Youth Day and uh, it's possibly take place in Mexico or Brazil. Uh, and with the hope that it does connect with, with indigenous youth, those who identify indigenous youth in, in North America and Africa and Asia and the Pacific Islands. Um, so it, it, it was kind of, a, a, it was something kind of grew and, and didn't take, a, a, and in the end, the participants didn't really take a, a global, uh, uh, it wasn't really participants from the, the global reality, rather Latin American. The, the second question, yes, there's, a, there's um, so the, the Nove dance is, uh, is sometimes used in the offertory procession here uh, in, in mass, for example. And there's other processes. Um, Speaking of the, the, the cultural piece, the ancestral piece, and, and the Catholic faith, we never want to force things into, a, into the Catholic liturgy. That would be confusing if people don't understand it in a Catholic context. So there's slow processes and, and what we call indigenous theology and, and, and pastoral reflection. But there are, for example, the Nobe purification ritual uh, is now part of the um, penitential rite, even when the bishops come. Uh, and so we're outside the space, and everything that happens uh, ritually uh, with the penitential rite, the symbolism is 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 part of the nobe uh, purification ritual. But there, there are processes that of, of evangelization because the people themselves, so we don't want to all of a sudden do something and people think it's it's confusing. 
And so they're catechetical and reflection theological processes uh, in, in a lot of places, not only here in Latin America, but, it, but in Africa and, and other places uh, in, in Asia, where there's this the theological process is beginning with ancestral wisdom and practice, and then putting it in conversation with the Catholic faith to come to a synthesis. So you don't get this kind of syncretist uh, doing two things that are unrelated, but rather they're, under, they're understood in their fulfillment in, in, in the gospel. Thanks for the question. Thank you very much, Dr. Father uh, Fitzgerald. Uh, I am now going to turn to a question that comes from Bill Kalana, and it's actually to all four of you. Uh, uh, as he puts it, all three of the presentations touched on the prevalence of individualism as a challenge to the Catholic identity of youth. And he would like to hear the, the presenters to reflect on individualism as one of the effects of neoliberalism and how the youth can help enact forms of resistance to neoliberalism. So this is for all four of you, if you can uh, begin to address, this is a complicated question, of course, uh, because it has on the one hand, if there's a diagnosis of individual and neoliberalism link, and then on the other hand, a possible sort of solutions or remedies for that, that would come from the youth, Catholic youth. I can invite uh, you. Go ahead. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, because my paper uh, particularly was uh, on that. I called it relativism, but it's all that individualism and you know liberalism, it's all there. Yeah. Uh, what I can say is that this affects uh, the faith of the youth in many ways. First, in individualism blocks other voices, it blocks outside voices that um, I only listen to my voice, my inner voice. So I become uh, the rule, uh, the measure of what is true, of what is right and what is bad and what is wrong. It is according to me, the way I determine it. But the truth, Jesus is the truth. We get the truth from God himself is the truth. And, and so that's where it comes from. And we, we have to listen to, 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 to God, what he tells us. And so uh, that's the, I think I consider that the, the biggest challenge of individualism and the relativism that it blocks voices from outside, which would have uh, been a guide because uh, young people are young people and uh, they probably have less experience they have uh, maybe, I don't, I, I can use it, that maybe they have less knowledge, <laughs> if I can use the word, they, they, still, they are still learning, they are still growing. And in our growing um, process, we need uh, things, we need people to learn from, uh, we need knowledge, to build knowledge and to grow us. And so if you block the voices, from outside, then you, you are going to go in an, a kind of eternal way of life. Instead of broadening your knowledge and your, uh, then you build a character and, and the faith. Of course, faith, we, we inherit faith. We do not create faith. So if faith is we need to listen uh, to the gospel. We need to listen to uh, the forefathers who came before us then we can be sure. Well, we're having some difficulties hearing Father uh, Sinondo. Uh, so maybe I can turn to other speakers with the same question, if you have some okay. reflections to offer or some insight. Yeah, I can, I can say something, uh, Slavika. Um, I think I think this orient, this current orientation of the Pope with with synodality, which I think is not well understood in some places, but it's very much very much our identity. And I think that's what, um, particularly with Indigenous youth, um, this this whole piece of in, individualism uh, and and neoliberalism, sometimes we address it in a functional way. Uh, I think what Indigenous traditions, the question is more of a who who are we, in, in terms of this piece? Are you know how, how are we connected? So neoliberalism in kind of a simplistic way might say we're, we're individuals in competition for the accumulation of material goods. I mean, that's, that's the image of, of human person 
uh, the individual looking for, uh, you know, looking for to, to win in the, ex in the exchange of goods uh, in the sense of accumulating uh, material wealth and, and, and such. Uh, and so indigenous traditions would say something very different. Um, here a generation ago, there was no private property uh, in, in, in the Noba, even the lands weren't de delineated where my farm ends and yours begins and those kinds of things. So that, but that was, an, that was a spiritual understanding. One of the, the Noba concepts, and it's the name of my book is to dance in Noble's house, which means dance in God's house. All of creation is one house and it's God's. And so it makes no sense that I wouldn't share what God has given us with, with, with the product. So it, it comes down in some sense to, to how we understand ourselves and ourselves in relationship to the material world and then that how that's manifest in practice. But then also, of course, the practice forms the understanding we have of ourselves and, and the material world. So it's kind of cyclical. And as I mentioned, especially if, if the, only, uh, the only possibility presented in informal education processes is be successful, which means an individual process uh, to, to become successful, which means making, making wealth for yourself. And many times for the indigenous means separating yourself from your, your your land and, and your cultural context, then uh, there's not a lot of options for the indigenous youth to say, well, what do I do? How do I, how do I be successful in, in the Nobe context, which isn't a neoliberal uh, individualistic context of accumulation of goods? How do I successfully be a member of a community with a communal identity with sharing as a foundation of social interaction? So it's not easy. Uh, you know, it's, not all, it's not all easy, this kind of resistance um, but we do, we do see it in, in some of the organization. And, and it, I think the Nobe deciding to not permit mines was denying wealth, uh, but it was also denying a, 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 co a concept of, of us as individuals uh, that cannot say no to, to wealth. And for the video you showed, it's actually, I mean, it's very clear that sense of personhood is very different. It's not just individualistic sort of understanding of, of the self. It's very collective. It's very group, group shape. Uh, Dr. Molino or Dr. Bering, would you like to comment on this question of uh, individualism and neoliberalism and how that plays out maybe in the Filipino context? Yeah, um, from the point of view of developmental psychology, um, individuality and youth identity is a youth project. So it is an orientation and it is, that is where they are uh, very much concerned about no? who am I, my identity, and which is also uh, uh, served by the neoliberal mindset and somehow influenced by that. No? Now, um, but what I'm looking at is I would prefer to, to share ideas in relation to the empirical results that I have. For instance, uh, how do the Catholic youth view the sacred, for instance? Is it uh, reflective of their individuality or individualism or such orientation? Um, what I'm seeing is uh, their, their view of, of the sacred is very much communal, very much oriented towards community and ethical life. So by that, uh, it, it suggests already a lot of things in terms of how they view the world, their worldview, and themselves in relation to that. And, and well, I have not explored yet in that along this line, but somehow this, this will tell me something about that, uh, that their kind of my, religious mindset is very much tempered by uh, how they view faith in relation to the world that I'm in, that kind of thing. No? So, so I'm, I'm, I'm more looking at a very positive, uh, optimistic, uh, outlook in terms of how the young of today negotiate their identity as individuals in relation to the community. That's, how, that's what I'm looking at. But I, I've not really explored yet uh, along these lines because that is, I suppose, a, a, a long discussion no? against the neoliberal mindset. So along that line. Dr. Molina. Yeah, um, I think uh... Being a uh, uh, an, an educator to encourage uh, both our young and professionals uh, to to take shared responsibility in promoting education, I think uh, that is uh, for the common good. No? That, I, I think that will uh, change the uh, uh, neoliberal status quo, and uh, with that, we able to harness uh, their knowledge about their own identity 
within their particular culture and the tradition and as well as their religion. And uh, it, it needs a lot of time and uh, uh, study to harness that kind of uh, field. Uh, because until now, we, we also observe, we still observe that to our uh, young people, especially inside the classroom, uh, that uh, typical uh, mind setting. And uh, just like what I have mentioned a while back, the, the dialogue is still uh, needed and we still to need to harness that kind of communication. Uh, now that we are in the field of the online education, especially that we are in pandemic, in pandemic uh, moment or uh, uh, era, I think we need to amplify you know, this uh, kind of uh, um, a responsibility as professionals to our young people to harness the communication using technologies also. And uh, with that, you know, we can able to uh, uh, submerge voices and to model citizenship within educational practice. Yeah. Just to give uh, an insight on how to, to, ch to change, at least on my own uh, point of view. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that particularly from your presentations, the empirical side uh, was very, very mm -hmm. useful in that regard. Uh, I'm looking at time and I just want to say that we had two more questions. One was really interesting, complicating the last question that we got from Jean-Paul uh, was a question about the ways in which individualism actually challenges the power of certain traditional customs like arranged marriages and child marriages. And I'm going to so just leave it for the speakers. If you want to type the answer, uh, uh, feel free to do that. Uh, this, the other question, which is a complex one, and I'm, I'm, I feel really bad that we have to sort of stop at this point, but I'll just read it. It's a, it's a question for Father Charles and Father Joe from Michael Buddy, but it's, it's also a question for, I think, Dr. Molina and Baring. Uh, is there a difference between pluralism and relativism? And I think it's a really important question, uh, sort of comparatively speaking, uh, how might we tell the difference between the two? in whatever context you're working. And I think, you know, if you're teaching in the context of American institution or in, in places where you are, I think this is a really uh, a challenging challenging question. So I want to uh, thank Michael Body for raising it for us. Um, at this point, I do want to thank all the presenters. Thank you so much for joining us in different time zones and different places. Uh, and thank you for stimulating, uh, for enabling this, I think really important conversation. It's a conversation about the relationship between the past and the future. And for that, for that, I am really grateful. I learned a lot, uh, uh, learn, learning from all of you, from your experiences and insights. I also want to thank the audience for joining us uh, on a Saturday morning. You have to be very driven to do so. Uh, I always like joining the Paul's conferences every year, precisely because I actually learn uh, a, a great deal. In conclusion, I want to say there's going to be a 30 minute break uh, and I invite everybody to join us again at 1130 uh, for the keynote panel with three members of the Vatican's International Youth Advisory Board. Um, so thanks again to everybody and uh, enjoy a break. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank you. Thank you all.